Hello and welcome to the latest community conversation here at Atlantic Health System. My name is Luke Margolis. I'm the Corporate Communications Director for Atlantic Health. And joining me again for his second community conversation, so good we had him back, Dr. Damian Martins. He is the Medical Director of Sports Medicine here at Atlantic Health System and the Team Physician and Director of Internal Medicine for the New York Jets. Dr. Martins, thanks for coming back. Luke, thanks for, thanks for having me. This is great. Sure. We've got a lot of ground to cover today on a topic that First of all, we've taken a lot of questions on it, so I can't even imagine how many questions you've been taking on it. Uh, and that, of course, is the return to uh, play here in New Jersey. And we're talking about high school sports. We're talking about uh, the return to physical activity, which has seen some pretty interesting developments this week. Uh, and really, and Dr. Martins, through his opportunities, his various professional opportunities, can shed a little light on really return to play nationwide and what a lot of different organizations are looking at as they get folks back in the gyms, on the playing fields, uh, and on the court. Um, before we do that, Dr. Martins, I just want to give folks a little, a, a little bit of background as to where they can see this program if they have to leave us midway for some point. Um, Facebook Live, obviously, is where we are now, but you can catch this on all of our social media channels. You can also see this, the audio version, I should say, you can hear the audio version of this on our SoundCloud account, which is essentially where we put all of our podcasts. And you can catch this on TV, if you're less of a computer fan, <laughs> on News 12 Plus on weekends, uh, that is 8.30 to 9 a.m. Saturdays and Sundays. So that is sort of, uh, that's a bolt of it all. Why Thank don't you. we uh, jump right into it? Sure, absolutely. And, and thanks for having me. And I, and I wanted to sort of start off by saying, you know, uh, understanding how important the facts and the science are here. So everything we're going to discuss today, uh, Luke has been, uh, you know, kind enough to sort of put the primary references out there. I encourage people to look at it. Just don't listen to uh to a, a guy in a white coat telling you what's going on is <laughs> as, as i tell my fellows at our sports medicine training program uh, you know trust but verify everything sure. and so i encourage everyone to sort of take a look at the the primary references and things we're going to talk about today and some of that stuff is from organizations like the cdc correct so as this uh, particular file gets added onto our website which is another place where you can see all of our community conversations uh, we'll have this information that Dr. Martin's just referenced posted for you there too. Uh, a lot of it's in PowerPoint format, so if that's easier, uh, you can just kind of click on it there and, and take a look at some of the material that Dr. Martin's is going to reference today. Uh, it has been a pretty busy, we'll call it 10 days, uh, yeah. in, in this dis conversation about returning to sports. Um, you have a role with uh, the NJSIAA, um, and I guess for the uninitiated, can, we, can you tell us what the NJSIAA is and what its responsibility is here? I'm going to simplify it. it is a, it's the organization that really oversees high school sports in the state. Uh, and they work with the Department of Health and the governor's office, uh, but really overseeing rules and regulations for high school sports in the state. And they uh, assembled, really, a, a medical advisory, yes. um, I guess, don't call it task, task force. force. Yeah. Task force, okay, of which you were a member, correct? Correct, correct. What was, um, what was the process like in terms of, of being a member of that, of that task force? And, and I know that there was a, some commentary in a report recently issued, so we'll get into that. Sure. But I guess some background for our folks uh, who are hearing about this for the first time. What, did, what was your role to play in working with the NJSI Well, the nice thing about this task force is that it was made up of a uh, you know, multidiscipline approach. So we had athletic directors, uh, coaches, physicians, administrators, nurses, Department of Health uh, administrators, et cetera. And, and really, I think what made it successful was the collaborative approach, but also the guiding principles. And I think first and foremost, it was understanding the health and safety of the athletes comes first. Uh, secondly, understanding that re-engaging these student athletes for their emotional, mental well-being and, and the physical benefits of exercise was key. So with those guiding principles, I think the task force went about over the last three or four months really taking a deep dive into what other states were doing, what the science was showing us, what the numbers were showing us to come up with what we think is really the safest way to return to sports in the state. So, uh, you know, we've had a lot of guidance from the Department of Health and from the governor's office, and over time things have evolved. And as you know, we are in a much better place in New Jersey than we were in March, April of, last, of this year. So mm -hmm. I think uh, as we walk through this presentation, we'll talk more about that. But that was really the, the major uh, influence of the task force is to put the, the summer session the phases together in a safe and effective way for kids to sort of maintain their fitness over the summer uh, in a protective way in pods so they weren't spreading the disease 
and then secondly, really focus on that, that this critical time of when school returns and how that's going to happen. So, Because club sports have been going on for a little while, right? Correct, correct. So if you go back into late June, uh, the governor gave the green light for club sports to go. Um, and then I think uh, at the very end of June, he gave the, the okay for NJSI AA to sort of put out their position on how they were going to return to sports. So a lot of what we're going to discuss today, we've had <clears throat> two plus months of data to show uh, club sports and summer sessions uh, estimated over 100,000 athletes have participated and we have not seen any outbreaks or uptick in positivity numbers. So that's been reassuring that the, the plan uh, we put in place seems to be working. So let's get right to it then. What, what do we, because fall sports, is, is the, the school year is essentially upon us. Within yes. the next week to 10 days, kids are, or whether it be in virtual classes or back actually in the classroom, that's all starting to happen now. So. Let's talk about from a fall sports season perspective. What can student athletes and parents expect and what are um, uh, trainers and coaches doing to, to get ready for that season now? I'm going to give you a quick summary, but I will tell you, any parent out there that's listening, <clears throat> I think it's an appropriate question to ask your school administrator, athletic director, athletic trainer. Make sure the plan is solid. We've given uh, very detailed guidelines, recommendations, but I think it's important that everyone at their own institution and school really make sure that, that these things are being met. Mm -hmm. I think the, the big take home message is that fall sports, outdoor fall sports uh, are okay to proceed. Uh, there's gonna be a two week hiatus when kids come back to school. You know, I thought, we thought the recommendation was wise that the kids get acclimated to the school environment, get themselves settled before they start practicing. Uh, but once that happens, there are some guidelines that we're gonna post uh, related to the, uh, the different staging of return to activity. I think they're very sound, but you will see outdoor sports uh, return. Uh, I think it's September 15th or so, roughly. Don't quote me on the exact time frame. Okay. Um, with, with the idea that indoor sports are a little more complicated. Well, uh, well, how are they complicated? So, so indoor sports, you know, again, if you go back to the basic science, we know that the primary spread from this virus is from close contact of respiratory droplets from an infected person. Hence all the mask work. Correct. Right. As soon as you go inside, you're in a confined area, so you don't have that ability to sort of distance as well. And it also leads to a lot of the complications that I think the school districts are going through in various states. <clears throat> different, the air quality inside is very different from outside. And so uh, we look at filtration rate, when you look at the MERV, M-E-R-V, the filter uh, rating, you want to have something, you know, typically, um, you know, you could walk into a hardware store and pick up a MERV filter of 9 or 13, but there are some recommendations based on indoor gymnasiums and indoor healthcare facilities that you do want a certain level of MERV filter rate. You also look at that air change per hour, which is a, a, how much air turns over in a given room. And, uh, you know, the guidelines are you want to see something four or more in air uh, turnover. So, Understanding that the state also has some limitations based on the governor's recommendations of the uh, number of people inside a facility, right, right. It, it just made sense at this point saying, look, we, we don't think we can tackle this indoor piece so quickly. Let's, let's go outdoors, let's move the sports outdoors, and we will move those indoor sports into a special session, sort of third season, if you will, in the early spring. Okay, so that's, that's important to get out too, right? So we <clears> have, <throat> traditionally, there are three scholastic sports seasons Correct. right you yep. have a fall season a winter season and a spring, spring season yep. what is the how are we doing it now how is it different so <clears throat> and i think you, you really have to give credit to the administrators at njsiwa realizing that any great plan we have is only based on the numbers and what the prevalence of this virus is going to be in the community they've really developed a, a plan to pivot to a different season and so if you go to the website you'll see the different dates for different seasons and at any given time you can pivot a sport and move it to a different season the goal here is really get these kids participating, get them exercising, C travel and, and competition is sort of put on the back burner this year. And so I think you will see these plans are well thought out with the idea of let them participate, get as much participation as we can and get them active. What are, with your, <clears throat> your clinical opinion and, and with your position here um, overseeing sports medicine here at Atlantic Health System, what is, what is the benefit of returning these students to, yeah. to athletics? It was, one of the first points you mentioned when you were talking about what NJSIAA yeah. wanted to accomplish in terms of, of examining why to return to sports, what, what is the importance of getting young people back into the swing of things athletically? Luke, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up, and I'm gonna really focus to, yeah. the, to the people at home on this one. Uh, any, any medical decision, any decision we make in life, there is a risk-benefit 
analysis that needs to be done. And there's no doubt that uh, there's a risk of a viral infection in COVID. But when you look at the downside of not exercising, I think that the people at home would be surprised at some of the, some of the information that we're gonna post on the website. Um, I see it firsthand, our sports psychologists see it firsthand, but when you start to look at the data, the NCAA published just last week their, their information where they surveyed over 30,000 athletes and with, with different screening tools for anxiety and depression that we use in the medical office. And I was shocked to see that uh, 25 to 30 percent of those athletes were clinically depressed or anxious based on these screening tools. But when you look at the population that's a little more appropriate for this discussion, the high school athletes, uh, the University of uh, Wisconsin just published this with about 30,000 high school athletes. And the interesting study here was that they had data pre-COVID and data post-COVID. And what they found was 70%, 70% of those high school athletes met clinical criteria for depression and anxiety. And when you looked at the data, the number one reason they attributed to it was that they couldn't exercise and they couldn't be part of their social network, their friends mm -hmm. participating in sports. By the way, that number doubled. So they had pre-COVID and post-COVID. So it doubled within this period. So I think it's really important that we understand the risks and benefits, whether that's emotional, social, physical, and let's not forget the immune system. There is no better way to cure depression and anxiety than exercise, but also boosting the immune system. So taking all these things into consideration, when you look at the risk in this school age group, we're gonna call that five to 18 age group here. Uh, and, and this data is, is on what we're posting at the, from the CDC. They are the least likely to get the virus. They're the least likely to get sick from the virus. They're the least likely to die from this virus. Not to say that anyone can't get it, but when you look at that risk benefit analysis, I think it's pretty clear that there are significant benefits to returning to sports in a safe environment. Mm -hmm. And that's why the committee was so firm on really putting some hard metrics to what's safe and what's not. And as you know, we get it every day from the hospital. Our great hospital system sends us the report, right? In terms of positivity rate, uh, transmission rate, number of hospitalizations. These are all things that the committee put out there and said, we're gonna follow these things. We're gonna follow with the COVID risk uh, index score based on these parameters to say when it's safe and when, when it's not. I'd, l I'd like to share with you kind of where we are. And I know you're, you're aware of this, but mm -hmm. If you look at national data in terms of positivity rates, it's about 10%. 10% of all the tests being done right now are running about positive. Nationwide. Nationwide. But that's a tremendous range. You've got Mississippi that's at 27%, and you've got Vermont, which is at 0.5%. New Jersey in the last few months has been running somewhere between 1% and 1.5%, so in a really good place compared to where we were. These numbers are right on par with what the NCAA is showing, what what professional sports are showing. What's really interesting about this data, and the Pac-12 just published this uh, two days ago, if you look at the Pac-12 data, they and that's were, all the schools on the west coast of the country. West coast, thank you. Yeah, you know, you they know were, who's watching, right? They, 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 with their intake testing, so what they do is a, a sort of a soft bubble, if you will, they bring all the athletes in and they test them day one. So that test result really is what's showing you what happened at home, right? That's the community spread from home. Right. They came in at about two and a half percent. At, in the Pac-12. Then they started, the, you know, they quarantined them, they began practice, they began contact. A month later, it had dropped to one and a half percent. And so it really does show, it gives us confidence that in a controlled environment, being socially responsible, wearing your mask, washing your hands, distancing, you can still play contact sports and in fact have a lower prevalence than you would in the general community. So I think that's really a, a good sign. What is the, because obviously this is a, a, a fluid situation and mm -hmm. circumstances continue to evolve as we see issues like community spread change uh, yep. throughout this, this situation. What are we, what is, is this sort of a, of a, a plan that can shift and change as necessary? Are we cast in stone? What is? What do we do if, say, in mid-November, yeah. situations have changed dramatically, circumstances on the ground have changed dramatically? Uh, no doubt. Uh, <clears throat> all these plans are, are created to pivot to a different season based on the numbers. And so, you know, what we tell you today may be very different if, uh, come October, the positivity rate is 8% or 10%. Right. Um, so you make a really good point. We're in a really good place. The numbers are very positive. We're very confident this is going to work. That being said, everyone on the committee is well aware that we need to watch these numbers and see what happens. Uh, fall sports includes contact sports like football, mm -hmm. um, but winter sports, 
sports that cannot be played yeah. outdoors um, include things like basketball. And you mentioned um, the uh, MERV rating, I believe it was, mm -hmm. for filtration. What, is it possible we could not have a winter sports season if, if things progress in a downward trend? Or would it, is it more likely that we would push back to the spring and try to reassess then? What, what are we doing as contingency? Are there contingency plans for things like this? Or is it too early to know that for sure yet? <clears throat> That, that I think I would leave to NJSI to answer. I, I do know they have, uh, they've worked very, very hard on contingency plans, both what you described, moving things back or pivoting to a different season. Uh, they have been very diligent in, in working on those contingency plans. So Nancy, I know you asked about what basketball season might look like. Uh, check out the NJSIAA's website for evolving calendar dates and times for a lot of these seasons. That's gonna be a good source of, of uh, a single source of truth for you for the state in terms of how they're handling it. Um, I, I want to, uh, we'll continue with our high school sports discussion as well, but I also want to talk about something that happened this week um, that I think is particularly relevant to this conversation, and that's the reopening of, of gyms, which yeah. uh, Governor Murphy has talked about. I believe it's going to happen as early as next week in certain, with certain modifications, right, in terms of capacity and, and things along those lines. So. Um, you and I and Dr. Um, Matt Martinez had a conversation, a uh, community conversation, not that long ago about returning to fitness and yes. returning to exercise. Um, and, and from a myocarditis and a health, a heart health standpoint, I would encourage people to check out that previous community conversation because that information is still very relevant yeah. uh, today. But I think, uh, Dr. Martins, if you would, let's kind of just give a, a little primer, a little 101 again on those who want to jump back into exercise, fitness, athletics, whatever it may be, um, what are some important things that they need to remember? And maybe this is even relevant for some of our student athletes who might not have been keeping up with their conditioning over the summer as well. <clears throat> it's a great point. It, it's very relevant, uh, complex topic, and I'm going to sort of touch on it from two ends. There's the deconditioning aspect, uh, cardiovascular and musculoskeletal deconditioning that uh, we I, we think we address that with the athletes by the summer session period of, of conditioning, but mm -hmm. r regardless, there's no doubt that when you don't exercise for a long time and go back to exercise, your injury risk goes up. So I think you have to be careful uh, and slow and steady in terms of your ramp up. You can't go from running uh, or working out five days a week, running 25 miles a week, doing nothing for three months and then expect to go back and do the same thing you're doing. Right? You can get hurt. Doing you're going to get hurt. You're going to end up in our office. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's not a great thing. We'd love to see you, but... Right. You know. The other aspect is, is a complex one is the myocarditis. There's been a lot of fanfare about this, and I sort of want to give you two perspectives on this and why it's really important for the high school athlete, but also for your general fitness population. So we've known in the sports medicine world, and, and again, as Luke said, I encourage you to go back and listen to Dr. Martinez, a sports cardiologist who's a real guru in this space, uh, his discussion on this. But myocarditis, uh, for lack of a better definition, is inflammation of the heart muscle. And what we know is that for years, by the way, we've known that in the world of sports, it's, it's one of the common causes of sudden cardiac death in athletes. Uh, depending on which study you look at, somewhere between 1% and 5% uh, of people who die suddenly, young people who die suddenly in sports, are related to myocarditis. Okay? Now, myocarditis has existed long before COVID, and it'll exist long after COVID. Uh, many viral, much more common viral infections cause it, so the flu will cause it. H1N1 was pretty classic at doing that. In the younger kids, Coxsackie, Parvo, these con common viruses. And one that's kind of near and dear to me because of the high school and college athlete is mono. Mononucleosis right. is also classically known to cause this myocarditis. So in general, uh, people who have acute viral illnesses, somewhere between 1% and 5% will develop some sort of inflammation in this heart. So, uh, you know, we're going to frame it in it's, it's not uncommon for this to happen. What we don't know is how does SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19, is it 1%, 0.1%, or 10%? We just don't have that data yet, but it's clearly something that needs to be on our radar. It's important from the high school standpoint, and that's why the committee was adamant about adding these questions to the health history questionnaire update. Yeah. So there are, as if you go to the website and you're enrolling your kids in sports and they're going through their sports physical, we've added questions to COVID because if, the, if your child has had COVID or has been in close contact with someone with COVID, the recommendation is that you see your physician and undergo an evaluation. The cardiac guidelines have been uh, on that website, so you can see exactly what tests need to be done. But again, this is an individual one-on-one -on -one discussion with your physician about what needs to happen. The Weekend Warriors, the, the older 
<laughs> not, not the aging athlete no, over you, here. You can, you can <clears throat> reference me. I fall into this bucket. That's fair. But you could also have COVID and may not know. And so for those people that I describe as, uh, you know, more than, more than your weekend warrior, your vigorous athletes, people who uh, are going back to exercise and notice that they're having shortness of breath or feel like they're more fatigued than usual, it's absolutely essential that you see your physician and make sure that you weren't diagnosed, that you didn't have COVID and you don't have any evidence of uh, myocarditis. And they'll do some relatively simple things, blood work, EKG, mm -hmm. uh, and as Dr. Martinez talked about, sometimes a cardiac echo or ultrasound of your heart. So I think it is very important if you have had COVID, been diagnosed with COVID, or had a close contact, uh, you know, a family uh, member or a household contact, that you meet with your physician to get checked out because it can be a serious issue. So this is usually the part of the show where I would now tell you, if you do not have a family physician or if you are looking for somebody who can assist you in this area, go to our website, AtlanticHealth.org, and check out the Find a Doctor portion right there at the top of the screen. It's literally right in the center, right towards the top. Click on that and you can find um, all types of physicians for a variety of different conditions that you may have concerns about or interest in and, uh, and all their contact information is on there too. So useful resource, I encourage you to check it out. Um, okay, so uh, George has a question on Facebook. Uh, does the NJSIAA have a, a plan in place or, or a, a process in place if there's an outbreak at a high school, right? So let's just say it has nothing to do initially mm. with the athletic portion of it, but the school itself has a cluster of students who have tested positive for COVID. Do they, is the plan then to have that school uh, halt sports or, or uh, are they, uh, what, what, what is the position put in place for the athletic teams to react to those changing circumstances on the ground? Common question uh, comes up a lot. Uh, you, will, you will find that guidance uh, on the NJSIAA website. Perfect. But in essence, what the recommendation is, they're gonna follow the Department of Health guidelines. So as you know, in this state, if you test positive, if you have a case, the Department of Health calls you, they do contact tracing. Yep. And so we are recommending that everyone follow the Department of Health guidelines in terms of contact tracing and isolation. And I know some folks may have some questions um, regarding a point Dr. Mar uh, Dr. Martin's made about uh, championships, playoffs, you know, play for the sake of play, all that kind of stuff. Um, I know there was a conversation recently um, that, that you took part in where that question came up. And I know that I think we all have to remember that the championships and the playoffs are, are an important part of this, but that appears to have sort of a secondary focus yeah. this time around. Yeah. Um, and I think a lot of that, uh, a lot of that information is visible on the NJSIAA website as well. So I would encourage folks to check that out. Um, so we've had some questions about football. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think the the closeness nature sure. of that game uh, has some folks wondering if maybe that's a a sport that, sh that should maybe go on the shelf for mm -hmm. the fall season. What's been the philosophy around football and what have you seen through your, your various positions and, and your various perspectives uh, about how football is, 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 is happening so far, how successful we are with it so far and, and where we're looking ahead for the season to come? Yeah, it's probably the one that's the, the most uh, complicated, right? Because you do have significant uh, contact. Now, there is, I think, some benefit to the, the helmet and the face shield because mm -hmm. again, this is primarily driven by uh, close contact, prolonged contact with respiratory droplets. But we can't deny the fact that there's close contact in football, it's right? The nature of the game, right? Um, we, you know, we can share with you uh, what's publicly uh, reported NFL data that they are seeing a significantly lower positivity rate than the general population. And they've had no outbreaks in, in, in any uh, professional contact sport. So uh, I, I, think it's, I think it bodes well for the sport of football. Uh, again, you, you have to follow the numbers. You have to see what happens. Maybe a very different story come October, November. We just don't know. What are you encouraging young people to, because I think you mentioned the, the value of the social interaction, mm -hmm. right? And I think for some of our young folks, that has truly been um, the thing that they appear to be looking forward to the most about the upcoming school season and, and sports season. Um, but with that comes the responsibility of, of yep. conducting themselves a certain way so as to mitigate risk. What is the advice you're sharing with the athletes who seek your medical counsel and, and even folks in your family, right? What, what is the guidance you're sharing with people <clears throat> about the upcoming season? So I, uh, we were speaking earlier. I, I told my professional athletes the same thing I told my two high school athletes who I have at home. There is a true competitive advantage for being socially responsible here. Washing your hands, wearing your mask, keeping a safe distance, not going to parties, doing your part is gonna make a big difference here. 
if you're a professional athlete and you bring this virus into your training room, into your team, and you start taking guys out with an infection, you're not going to win that game. You may not win that season. So clearly, just as working out, training, studying your playbook, watching video, there's a true competitive advantage for behaving yourself here. I think the high school athletes are starting to get that. As the seasons are coming, they're starting to practice and roll. They understand that if they can behave themselves, they're, they're much more likely to get this virus at the shore, at a party, or you know, some other location they are in a school. A large social gathering. Correct. Yeah. So it's really important that these kids understand that, that uh, that's what's going to make it a successful year for them. It's going to make or break them. Not only them, but also their family. So you know, as we said, the, the, this age group of 5 to 18 is the lowest risk in the entire country of getting this but they could bring it home to someone else if they're not careful. So we really encourage these kids to be smart, be responsible. And if they want to play sports, this is what they're going to have to do. So being a good teammate in this case extends far beyond just the field. Absolutely. Um, we have a question. Um, uh, Kenneth on, on Facebook wants to know for, for things like um, running during practice. Mm -hmm. um, Folks who would want to wear a mask maybe while doing so, mm -hmm. is that something that you'd be willing to support? Is there any, do we have any knowledge at this point about what um, doing some of those calisthenics or l uh, low intensity exercise and running while wearing a mask may, may do? Is that a bit of a personal preference it's, thing at this point? It's a complicated one. I think there's, there's evidence that as your heart rate and respiratory rate goes up, you increase, take a deep breath, and you're more likely to spread viral particles. There's also a trade-off though that if you've ever tried to run on a treadmill at 10 miles an hour with this mask on, it's not easy to do, right? Right, right? And so, you know, what a lot of teams have chosen to do is wear the masks or facial coverings during warm-ups, during calisthenics, but once they hit more than a moderate level of physical activity to pull the mask down. Mm -hmm. But what you can do is as you're doing your sprints or your workouts, you do that, and then when you're off on the sideline listening to the coach or resting, you pull your mask back up. Um, uh, Kenyatta has a question about athletes who, uh, student athletes who have issues like asthma and things like that. Yeah. They need to be particularly cautious yes. about, about this season, don't they? They do. Uh, I think there's obviously evidence that that's one of the risk factors. Uh, more so in poorly controlled asthma, those who have been hospitalized or those who are on, on steroids to control the inflammation. But it also makes wearing the mask a lot more difficult. Right. Uh, they already have a, uh, a harder time getting a good breath and adding this mask makes it a little more complicated. So I recommend parents who have children who do have risk factors, uh, that's an individual discussion with your pediatrician, yep. with your sports medicine doctor, and say, does this make sense for my kid? One thing I forgot to mention, um, there was a part of that sort of fourth season. Mm -hmm. uh, the sports that are involved in that, we know girls volleyball is traditionally a fall sport, right? I think, that, yes. Uh, gymnastics, I think, has been moved. Um, the NJ, uh, NJSIAA website will have that. It, it has that on a special section. So yes. if you have uh, student athletes in your family who participate in, in particularly in indoor, indoor sport. sports, you got to check that out just to make sure you're aware of what the current standing is for, uh, for your students. So Dr. Martin, uh, Dr. Martins, we have about a minute left. And so uh, it's hard to summarize <laughs> a half an hour discussion yeah. in a minute. But as best we can, um, what, what would be uh, your, your most important takeaway for folks as we look at what we have in our hands coming this fall for, for high school sports? What, what's uh, a final thought or some final guidance you would, you would want to leave with parents and, uh, and coaches as we get ready for hopefully a, a successful, if different, fall sports season? What, what would you say? I, I think you've, you've nailed it. It's going to be different. It's not going to look the same. I think if everyone does their part here, I think there's a real opportunity to, to finish the season uh, without a serious outbreak. I really do believe at the end of the day, the benefits of exercise, emotional, social, physical, immune system uh, are tremendous. I really, I really implore the kids and the coaches and the staff to do all the things we've outlined, the temperature screenings, the screening questionnaires, the washing the hands, the face mask. If they do this, I really believe they have a competitive advantage and they're going to pull the season off. Dr. Damian Martins, thank you so much for joining us today, again, for the second time. You're welcome. All right, Take folks. Take care. And thank you for tuning in to this latest community conversation. As I mentioned before, it lives uh, both on our Facebook thread. If you missed any part of it, check it out there. Also on our other social media accounts, you'll find links on our Twitter page and on LinkedIn. SoundCloud, if you're looking for the audio version, if you're a podcast fan, of course, on our website, AtlanticHealth.org. And this coming weekend on News 12 Plus at 8.30 
uh, to 9 on Saturday and Sunday. My name is Luke Margolis. I'm the Corporate Communications Director here at Atlantic Health. Thank you so much for joining us, and we'll see you next time.